Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. My name is Reed, and today we're going to be going over the mechanism and electrophysiology behind uh, the diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH, on ECGs. And LVH, as you can imagine, as the name explains, is um, it occurs when the left ventricle, which is already a pretty strong uh, muscular component of the ventricular system, gets even stronger. Right? It builds a lot of muscle, right? just like a bodybuilder builds hypertrophy in the gym. The left ventricle, in this case, has a lot of hypertrophy, and it is represented on the ECG in a certain way. And so I want to kind of talk about what we can possibly see that can clue us into LVH. And so first thing I do, as always, is I'm going to take you all to my diagram. You can see we're going to be going through four ECGs today. If you want access to those ECGs, head down to the link in the description so that you can download the PDFs for yourself and keep them for your own studies, share them with your classmates, whatever you want. And so let's talk about left ventricular hypertrophy. We'll start on the limb leads, talk about maybe what we could see. So remember that normal conduction occurs, you know, when the AV node receives signal from somewhere within the atria, and it sends those signals down this Hiss bundle, down the right and left bundle branch. And so then we get that nice uh, activation of our ventricles, and we know that the normal wave of depolarization kind of heads down and to the left, favoring kind of the apex there, because we know that the left ventricle is a little bit stronger compared to the right ventricle, right? So those waves are usually kind of headed this way. So normally, we have QRSs that are kind of in this region. Well, sometimes you can get a left ventricle that is so strong, this is so strong, right? This is my muscle build left ventricle here. Sometimes you can see the axis start to shift a little bit towards the left. So sometimes you can see plus or minus, sometimes you can see left axis deviation. It's really not a criteria though that is Utilize as much as if you look and remember our right ventricular hypertrophy video, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy, you don't have to have left axis deviation. What you will have, however, is a lot of force, more force than normal, heading where? Towards the left ventricle. And what leads are capturing and the limb leads here are capturing those forces going towards them. Well, we really think of their lateral leads, which one of those is AVL, another one is those in lead one. And so we will see increased positive amplitudes in these leads, right? In leads one and in leads AVL. And similarly, if you look at what's occurring on the opposite side, look at lead three. All of those signals that are going towards the left ventricle because it's so hypertrophied, they're going away from lead three. So lead three, you will see negative amplitudes. Right? You'll see a, a very high amplitude in the negative direction, right? So that will be kind of this big negative deflection where over here we're going to see big positive deflections, right? And so there are criteria, there are so many criteria y'all for uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, but one of the criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy in these leads is if you take the amplitude of the R wave in lead one, and you add it to the S wave in lead three. And if you add those together and it is greater than 25 millimeters combined, that's diagnostic criteria for LVH. So that's one of our diagnostic criteria. That's one. Okay. A second diagnostic criteria is that you have 
an R wave in lead AVL that is greater than 11 millimeters. So that's another diagnostic criteria, right? That just means that we have positive forces in AVL that are greater than 11 millimeters, right? And so those are my two favorite ways to determine uh, left ventricular hypertrophy on my limb leads, the coronal leads, right? These are my limb leads, okay? And that's remember, that's because of how the forces, the amplitudes of the forces that are going towards that left ventricle and how they're being captured, right? And so essentially, we're adding the positive forces that are being captured in my lateral leads with the negative forces that are being captured down here from kind of my infra leads, lead three. And then we're also looking at some of the positive forces in the lateral leads, right? So a couple different criteria there. <clears throat> Let's transition over to this transverse view or the precordium, right? V1 through V6. So similar concept, my left ventricle, which is sitting right here. Usually my depolarization is kind of headed towards the left ventricle anyways because it's a little bit stronger than the right, but now it's really strong. Now look how strong our left ventricle is. I'm gonna color it in in red. It's gonna represent all this big muscle that the left ventricle is hypertrophied, like kind of like a bodybuilder. So LV is, is big, big, big. And so what are we gonna see? We're gonna see even more amplitude of forces, high amplitude forces going towards drawn towards that left signal whenever the ventricle is depolarized. When the AV node decides to send that signal down, it's really going to bias the amplitude of these waves is going to bias the LV. So what does that mean? That means that we are going to have very high signals in the lateral V5, V6. So these will have high positive amplitudes. Right, similar concept to our limb leads that the lateral sides that are representing those are going to have high positive amplitudes. And then if you look over here in V1, you're going to also have high amplitudes, but they're going to be negative amplitudes in V1 because the forces are going away from V1. Right? And so you will see that represented as in V1, you'll see these really deep waves in V1, but in V5 and V6, you're gonna see these really, really, really positive waves. And so what you can do is you can have a third criteria. This is one of the more common criteria where if you take the S wave, the amplitude of the S wave in V1, and you add it to either whichever one is taller, the R wave in V5 or V6, right, the R wave. So whichever one is taller, if that is greater than 35 millimeters, then you have another criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. Right, so my S wave in V1 represents the negative forces that are going away towards that left ventricle from V1. And then those R waves and the lateral leads are measuring it towards. And so you're just essentially quantifying in millimeters the amplitude there. So remember, diagnostic criteria. First criteria is that we need to have a narrow QRS, right? If the AV node is conducting that signal down into the ventricles, it should be doing it through the Hisperkinji system and creating a narrow QRS that is less than 120 milliseconds in duration. And then we have these three diagnostic criteria that are explained anatomically that we just kind of went over. <clears throat> and so let's go through some ECGs and take a look at what this might look like in real life. This is a pattern that you'll start getting familiar with. And remember, LVH can be kind of can show itself in any rhythm that's occurring with good AV nodal depolarization. And so what you'll notice here is we've got a sinus rhythm 
If you look down here in lead two, we've got P waves that conduct to our QRS, P waves that conduct to our QRS. I look at my QRS axis, my QRS is upright in lead one. It's isoelectric and AVF, so that tells me if it's perpendicular to AVF. So my QRS axis is going kind of right along. It's like just like a left axis shift. It's a little bit more leftward than usual. And so I'm like, huh, I wonder, maybe this person has LVH. And I look at the lateral leads. V5 and V6, and I see, wow, tall R waves, right? V5, the baseline is right here. My R wave is all the way up there, if you can see it. And so I know that if I measure the R in V5 and I add it to the S wave in V1, if it's greater than 35 millimeters, then that's LVH. And so let's do that. So let's count my R wave. We've got 5, 10, 15, 20. 25 looks like 28 millimeters amplitude and let's count the s wave here in v1 so we've got there's my isoelectric line there's my s wave so we've got three eight looks like nine millimeters and so if i add 28 plus nine if i add those together we get 28 plus 9 equals 37 millimeters. It's greater than 35 millimeters, and so we've got left ventricular hypertrophy, right? So there's one example. Let's take a look at the next ECG. We've got another sinus rhythm, right? We've got P waves that are conducting to our QRS, P waves that are conducting to our QRS. So we know the QRS is narrow. It's being conducted from the AV node down I look and I see that I've got a normal QRS axis. My QRS is upright in lead one. It's just as upright in AVS. It tells me my QRS axis is going down to the left, which is normal. That doesn't exclude LVH. You can see, kind of just looking at it, you can see, huh, I do have some tall R waves in V5. And I do have some deep S waves in V1. So let's measure those. I wonder if I have RVH. And so we can measure the R's. Here, here's my baseline. Here's my ape, the kind of the apex, the tip of the R wave. We've got 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe 23 millimeters R wave. And my S in V1, here's my baseline. Here's the ending. We've got, what is this, maybe 3, 8, plus 5 is 13, plus another 4 is 17 millimeters so you add those together 17 plus 23 and what do we get we get 40 millimeters which is greater than 35 millimeters so there is criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy on ECG All right let's take a look at another example here we have um, this is a really fun ECG, actually. Uh, I really like this one. So we've got a sinus rhythm, right? We've got, if you look down here in lead two, we've got P waves that are conducting to our QRS. Okay, our QRS complex looks kind of crazy. It's not wide. It's still narrow. But if you look, it's upright in lead one. And it's a little negative in AVF. So that means it's telling me it's going away from AVF but towards lead one. So my axis of ventricular depolarization is kind of that direction. So we've definitely got left axis shift in a narrow complex QRS. So I definitely think, huh, LVH, right? So I look and I see, wow, I've definitely got crazy deep S waves. Look how deep V2 is all the way down to there. That is absurdly deep. And then we've still got these somewhat positive forces here, V5, V6. And so I look maybe for criteria. Remember AVL, if AVL is greater than 11 millimeters in amplitude, then we have criteria. So my baseline for AVL it's right there. Top is right there. And so we can see we've got 3, 8, and then another 4. So that's 12 millimeters. 
So that right there is criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. What clued me in on this one for LVH is just how deep these S waves are, right? If those S waves are so deep in the leads V1 and V2, that tells me that there's a lot of forces going away from V1 and V2. It tells me a lot of forces are going away from V2. And that's that makes me think physiologically LVH, right? And so um, you've also got this pattern that you guys will come familiar with, right? So in LVH, you get oftentimes something called strain. And a strain pattern is an ST segment and T wave abnormality where you actually get a little bit of ST depression and T wave inversions in the leads that are representing the abnormality, right? So LVH, you see these strain patterns in the lateral leads, okay? And that's because the ventricle is so hypertrophied sometimes, it's so hypertrophied that depolarization when it's occurring through that muscle is just a little bit off so that the repolarization is just a little bit off as well. And so you get some of these strain repolarization patterns, which are our ST and T wave segments. So that's kind of an interesting finding. There's other findings on this ECG that are kind of out of the scope of this video. We've got some atrial abnormalities as well, right? Um, something I want to, you know, if you've got LVH, that left ventricular is hypertrophied. Well, why is it hypertrophied, right? Well, for one, number one cause is chronic hypertension, right? The LV is pumping blood to the rest of the body, and so if that blood flow is high pressure, then the LV is going to need to get stronger. And also, you can look for, if you see LVH, you can look for left atrial enlargement, right? If the left ventricle is hypertrophied and has a lot of strain, well, the left atria is what is pumping blood to the left ventricle, so you might have some strain in the left atria as well. You can see that here but we're not gonna talk about that here, right? Look at that video, I've got another lecture on that. Last ECG here, we've got um, a different rhythm here. You can see we've got an atrial flutter. We have the sawtooth baseline pattern with these QRS complexes, right? So this is atrial flutter. With variable conduction and so we have atrial flutter with variable conduction and my QRS complexes you can see are narrow you can see that they're upright in lead one they're negative in AVF that tells me that my QRS axis is going a little bit leftwards so we have left axis here and you can see that I'm looking for what is LVH criteria well Remember, if AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, which we have 5, 10, 15, definitely greater than 11. So here we have AVL is greater than 11 millimeters. So we have criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. So remember, you can expect LVH if you have maybe some leftward axis deviation, you know, a patient has a history for it, or you can just look for it, right? Remember that we have multiple criteria for LVH, right? Here are the three criteria here. Um, and remember the LVH is, is a better diagnosis from like an echocardiogram, like an imaging standpoint. So the ECG can give you some clues, but the ECG also isn't the most sensitive for it, but it is somewhat specific. So if you see it, they probably have it. So I hope this helps you all. If you have any questions, put them down in the comments. And if not, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.